in high school, but it was after lunch, so I was always stoned. And I think if I tried to smoke marijuana to remember again, it wouldn't work as a cognitive enhancer, so um, I'm not going to try it. But um, I, I'm here today to talk about the techno-progressive idea or intervention. I want to start by pointing out that as soon as we became symbol-using hominids, about tens of thousands of years ago, we probably started to think about what kinds of better bodies and what kinds of better societies we could have, what it would be like to be without want, without violence, what it would be like to be without disease, to live longer. And we know that those ideas were immediately expressed in our religious ideas, our myths, our spiritual practices, ways of attempting through spirituality, through herbs, through the sciences of the time, to accomplish those things. And the difference uh, that makes this, that turned this into the origins of transhumanism was its meeting the ideas of the Enlightenment three, four hundred years ago. The idea that human beings could control their own affairs through science and reason, that rational individuals could create a society based on mutual association instead of tyranny. Um, the idea that we could tolerate a diversity of thought and lifestyles and experiences. These ideas uh, formed the core of much of the politics that we have been struggling with <coughs> for the next 300 years, for the last 300 years. And there are several different families of thought that have emerged out of the Enlightenment, out of the kind of overlapping memes that were involved in that broad phenomenon. So one was the idea of liberty, which some would associate with the Scottish wing of the Enlightenment, the idea of neoliberalism or uh, the free market laissez-faire, and so, so on. The more egalitarian wing, the more French wing of the Enlightenment, associated with more egalitarian politics, and then the rational and techno-optimism part. My argument in the rest of the talk is that techno-progressivism is the inheritor of, of all three of those mimetic contributions. But that there are some uh, transhumanists who have inherited more of this side. Um, I suspect there will be some who will inherit more of this side, less of the liberty side. We haven't quite seen them yet, but we can talk about where they might be. Um, and there are certainly people who, who have the, these values, but who do not share the techno-optimism anymore. And that has shaped a lot of the conflicts about uh, transhumanism and techno-progressivism. For me, the discovery of Condorcet, and especially this essay of his that he wrote while he was hiding from the French Revolution, sketched for the historical progress of the human mind, I'm not sure what the French title is. But this essay is astonishing calling for women's suffrage opposed to slavery, imagining the end of labor, and imagining the end of disease and death. And we see a similar kind of techno-optimism in the work of William Godwin, the anarchist, um, the work of Diderot. And we see it expressed in the early, some of the early workers' movement, and people associated with Marxism, people like J.B.S. Haldane, a British Marxist who whose essay, Daedalus, Science of the Future, first proposed in nuclear <coughs> fertilization and genetic engineering, and which was one of the things that horrified Aldous Huxley so much that he wrote Brave New World. And it also inspired Julian Huxley so much that he would eventually coin the term transhumanism. J.D. Bernal, another Marxist, uh, I think it's Irish Marxist, Irish Marxist, uh, who wrote one of the first essays proposing cybernetic implants in 1929. So much of the, for much of the period after the Enlightenment, the ideas of techno-optimism were often usually associated with the left. That began to change after World War II because of the experience of the war, um, the bomb, uh, the growing environmental movement, the counterculture, 
there were a, a number of things which began to tease apart the association of techno-optimism. You know, as Lenin said, communism is socialism plus electricity. Uh, that, that kind of techno-optimism began to decline after the war. Most of the template of politics in Europe and the United States for the 20th century was shaped by the struggle over the enlightenment values in culture and anti-enlightenment values in culture, and the struggle over the Scottish versus the French interpretations of political economy. And that shaped this terrain in which social democrats were in one corner, the right in another, libertarians in one corner, and populists in another. In the United States, we only have the two-party system, so it's basically social democrats versus the right, although I wish our social democrats were more like your social democrats, but they're not. Um, and our libertarians and our populists uh, are small. My proposal is that uh, just as 200 years ago, the Saliniers here in Paris would have a tea party, and uh, Diderot would say, wouldn't it be amusing if women could vote, <laughs> and then everyone would titter, ha oh, ha ha, that's wonderful. <laughs> Have some more sherry, um, or champagne. Uh, that, those ideas were part of intellectual discourse. They were being discussed, perhaps dangerously sometimes. Eventually, you had women starving themselves to death, attempting to win suffrage. Eventually, the idea of general workers' suffrage went from a parlor room discussion to bombs and strikes and trade union movements and labor. <coughs> the rubber meets the road with the crystallization of intellectual ideas into actual political ideas. My proposal is that bioethical conflicts, which in the 19, which emerged in the 1960s and 70s around brain death, the end of death decision making, abortion politics, and so on, have begun to create the terrain of a new axis of politics, a biopolitics or a technopolitics, that these terrains are raising questions about who is a citizen with a right to life? How should we control reproduction? Whether we should fix disabilities, whether we should have human enhancement, whether we should extend human life, and how we should control the brain. And that in general, the terrain of these, of how we respond to these questions is shaped by these pre-existing enlightenment memes, techno-optimism, techno-pessimism, and so on. And then we're beginning to see a more three-dimensional structure of politics. Now, I will, I will chasten myself in this prediction in a second, but on this dimension, transhumanism Bioconservatism is the biopolitical terrain, and it creates three dimensions out of the pre-existing two-dimensional terrain. Now, with due respect to my colleague uh, Natasha, and we can discuss this later, um, I do think that there was a strong libertarian focus in the early emergence of the transhumanist movement. Max uh, wrote things like eliminating the state, uh, deep anarchy, uh, they were warmly embraced by anarchists uh, or libertarians in the American libertarian movement, like Ron Bailey, whose book Liber Liberation Biology stands as a quite clear explication of a libertarian approach to transhumanism. And that was one of the first explications of the strong uh, techno-optimistic idea in a biopolitical context, at least in the United States, and it quickly spread around the world and inspired some European intellectuals as well who tended not to share the anarcho-capitalist orientation, and we'll talk about them in a second. But one of the other things it did was eventually those memes scared the hell out of some conservative intellectuals in the United States, uh, like Leon Cass and Frank Fukuyama, who, to the great surprise of us all, and, and really the great delight, um, decided once uh, Cass was appointed to the President's Council on Bioethics in 2003, to by President Bush in order to stop stem cell research, Cass said, well, really the most important thing is to stop transhumanism. And we're going to put together this book, Beyond Therapy, to argue why transhumanism is a bad idea. Frank Fukuyama was on the council at the time as well. At the same time, the Vatican was getting interested in biopolitics. The American Christian right was getting interested in biopolitics. Environmentalists like Bill McKibben were writing books about um, uh, why transhumanism was a bad idea. 
this was a landmark moment when uh, a broad swath of people in the political landscape started to pay attention to the debate over human enhancement. In the United States, of course, the big elephant in the room is always the Christian right, because they're you know, far more powerful than many other political forces. And they are, of course, opposed in general to human enhancement ideas. But um, around the world, and, and also in the United States, you have other forces, deep ecologists and romantic Luddites, left-wing and feminist critics of biotech, people who are, whose principal concern is to protect human beings against anything that would crit, you know, critique the centrality of human exceptionalism, animal rights, for instance. And then people who are in the disability rights movement who argue against any kind of curative or assistive or enhancement technology on the grounds that it's ableist. The kinds of terrains of the argument that began to be shaped were about things like human exceptionalism versus the argument for psychological personhood. So this argument I'll get into in a second. The argument about humanism versus sacred taboos, whether a yuck factor, as, as Leon Cass famously said, there is a wisdom and repugnance that uh, your yuck feeling about something, your disgust feeling was enough. Um, and those of us with more enlightenment values saying, no, that's really not enough. Um, and whether risks are manageable or whether they are unknow unknowable and the precautionary principle should trump risk. On the human exceptionalism question, this is where, of course, the Christian right uh, really focuses. Because the Christian right's position is that only human beings are bearers of moral standing, and that they are bearers of moral standing from conception until heart death. And so they have been exercised about a broad swath of issues, starting with abortion, also abor uh, brain death. But they're also critical of the notion that any kind of blurring of the boundary of humanness uh, could possibly be in God's plan. Um, the transhumanist position, which I would trace back to Locke, Locke's meditation on what it takes to stand before God on Judgment Day, and it only takes memory, because he argued God doesn't have to recreate your body, all he has to do is recreate your memories, because those are what he's going to judge you on, your memories of your actions. So Locke argued, and we continue to argue, that personal identity is fundamentally psychological, and if that's the case, then you can be human, you can have human DNA and not be a person, or you could be a person and not be human. That's a very different way of looking at moral standing than the human-centric, or what I sometimes call the human racist view. Now, 10 years ago, the Christian right began to pour millions of dollars into training a cadre of uh, Christian right bioethicists which they have uh, now instantiated in schools and institutes and <coughs> debates and legislatures all across the country. Um, and these are some of the think tanks that they are in. As These slides are online, so you can download this later for your amusement. There are also where left-wing organizations started, um, one of which is the Center for Genetics and Society, which believed that any attempt to manipulate uh, human reproduction with assistive technologies, genetic modification, and so forth, will lead to a neo-eugenic future that will be bad for women, minorities, uh, the poor, and so on. And they have been spending a lot of time fighting um, stem cell research, embryonic stem cell research, and now surrogate motherhood. But uh, every once in a while they come and take a whack at us transhumanists. Uh, the deep ecology movement, um, Luddite movement. I, I, say, I use the term cautiously because I know that some people don't like it. Some of them embrace it. For me, a Luddite is someone who sees a social problem and says that the social problem is caused by a technology and the way to stop a social problem is to stop a technology. And I think the critique of that is to say, if you see patriarchy, then the way to stop that patriarchy is not to stop any particular technology, it's to stop patriarchy. Uh, but for these deep ecologists and Luddites, uh, they want to stop certain technologies. And people, as I said in the D disability rights movement, I, you know, I caution this by saying that the vast majority of people who are disabled around the world 
will welcome assistive and or curative technologies. However, uh, there are certainly legitimate questions, which I'll come to in a minute, about how we negotiate identity, how we negotiate the rights of the disabled in the transition ahead. Now, when the conservative, the bioconservatives got control of the pinnacle of American biopolitics, the President's Council on Bioethics, the uh, former liberal bioethics regime was quite offended and uh, they started to push back. And one of the ways that they pushed back is that they became far less diffident, far less cautious on the question of human enhancement. People like Art Kaplan, second guy from the left there, in uh, the 70s, 80s, if you'd asked him, what do you think about cognitive enhancement? He said, well, on the one hand, on the other hand, blah, blah. By the time uh, the middle of the 2000s came, he was saying, on human enhancement, everybody should have access to the same pills. That's my position. He was you know, right out there in front, uh, putting it back on the bioconservatives. And a broad swath of liberal American bioethicists began to move closer to the transhumanist movement. Art Kaplan's now a trustee of my organization, and Glenn McGee is now one of our fellows. Similarly, in Britain, you have <coughs> bioethicists like Julian Savulescu, who's basically a hand grenade thrower, but you know he, he, he's become very popular as an enhancement advocate. John Harris, uh, uh, others, uh, joining Jonathan Glover, who uh, was there a long time ago, um, who have become quite forthright advocates, in addition, of course, to the Oxford crowd, which is basically a transhumanist encampment now. Um, and within transhumanism, with, and I was the executive director of the World Transhumanist Association from 2004 to 2008, and while I was there as a sociologist, of course, I did surveys, I did lots of membership surveys, and one of the things I was interested in was our politics. This were the results of the three membership surveys I did, 2003, 5, and 7. And we uh, asked a series of political terms, whether people identified with them. And uh, in the, across those years, we, the people on the left within the organization, which was quite a diverse left, uh, outnumbered the people in the libertarian wing by some number. Now, they're, given all these terms, I've always wondered what the other category was. And, I think these people want to be ruled by the three-breasted queen of Mars or giant robots or something. I'm not quite sure. But um, basically, it was libertarians and the left and then people who were even more visionary than that. Um, and those of us on the left, um, around 2007, 8, started to call ourselves techno-progressives. Um, and we had briefly a techno-progressive uh, caucus within the... Italian Socialist Party, and now uh, Amon, who we'll talk in a second, um, has identified with the term and the Technoprog group, and we had a group around um, a blog, and, and so on. There were a variety of people who started to call use this term, but not very many. I did a survey last year uh, of the audience of my organization. 400 people responded, half of them, 200 people, identified as techno-progressives. And these were the terms that they identified in addition to techno-progressive with their own politics. Progressive, anti-racist, feminist, up-winger, that's a, a term from FM 2030, Democrat, social democrat, moderate, democratic socialist, and so on. And these were the movements that they were most supportive of. Transhumanism, abortion rights, environmentalism, dignity and dying, disability rights, secularism, and drug, drug legalization. My prediction in the early part of the 2000s that there was going to be this big biopolitical uh, formation was short-circuited, I think, by the economic crisis of 2008. It, it strongly reasserted the primacy of the economic. But something that also happened within the transhumanist movement was the growth of a subsect, uh, what I call our millennialist, millennialist subsect, the singularitarians, and also the growth of a certain amount of libertarian hegemony. On the libertarian hegemony, uh, we had the foundation, for instance, of Singularity University, headed by the libertarian Peter Diamandis. Uh, Kurzweil's politics, always a little vague, kind of liberal, but uh, not terribly regulatory. Um, and basically, Singular Singularity University is a coffee clutch for transhumanist-friendly entrepreneurs. And then we had the 
growing ascendancy of Peter Thiel, who's the principal financial backer for the libertarian presidential <coughs> candidates Ron and Rand Paul, uh, a backer of several of the leading transhumanist organizations as well. In terms of the singularitarians, um, as a sect, they come in various flavors, ranging from believing that mana will fall from heaven to those who think that we're all going to die. But in general, between those, two posi those various positions, there's not much room for political engagement. There's a strong elective affinity between singularitarianism and libertarianism because they generally think that governments are too stupid to either assure the mana from heaven or stop the giant robots. Um, and so the singularitarian growth has also been a libertarian phenomenon, generally. The growth of the grinders has also been somewhat libertarian in that they generally don't think the state, and I don't either, think the state has a right to stop you from sticking something under your skin. But I hope that the kind of evolution they go through is the same one that ACT UP went through, which was that ACT UP had started in a period when they insisted that every HIV positive person should have the right to take any drug they wanted, and then realized that what they really wanted was drugs that worked, and the way to do that was to support science, not citizen experimentation. Even more troubling, we've had the emergence of an explicitly uh, anti-democratic phenomenon within transhumanism called the neo-reactionaries. They're not big. They are prominent um, in some cases, who explicitly reject democracy, explicitly embrace social hierarchy, authoritarianism, monarchy, um, and are quite disturbing. Um, I don't know how seriously to take them, but uh, they also call themselves the Dark Enlightenment. And this guy happens to be very nice, Zoltan Istvan, um, but his novel, which uh, people have described charitably as worse prose than Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged and even worse politics, um, is uh, explicitly individualistic in its politics, but instead of Ayn Rand's conclusion of all the rich people just buggering off to an island, uh, he establishes a global dictatorship and establishes transhumanist totalitarianism. Uh, the popularity of this particular novel among some transhumanists who are hungering for political engagement is extre extremely disturbing. So, over the course of the last 10 years, some of my predictions about political phenomena have come true, at least in this kind of micro way. We see people emerging in the various corners of these, of these terrains, religious transhumanists who are social conservatives but adopt many of the other beliefs of transhumanism, the neo-reactionaries, and so forth. And what I'm looking forward to is what is the next phase of biopolitical crystallization on a mass level? How will, how will we see biopolitics begin to take shape on a mass level? What conflicts will begin to shape the public imagination about these things? Things like generational conflict around life <laughs> extension therapies. Young people annoyed that their parents aren't dying soon enough so they can inherit their stuff. Or, Cognitive enhancement around class conflict. People annoyed that the rich are getting all the good jobs because they have all the right drugs. Or gene therapies and germinal choice pitting the seculars against the religious. How will that interplay with, and how will we see the emergence of whatever the next left is going to be? In the United States, we see the massification of biopolitical, individual biopolitical attitudes ranging from 13% of Americans who think that human cloning is okay to 59% who are <laughs> clearly techno-optimistic. So depending on how you frame what a transhumanist worldview is, you can say various kinds of people are in that, advocating for life extension and whatnot. The principal concern that Americans have about life extension is, do you think that everyone should be able to get it? Yes, 79% agree. Do you think that only the wealthy would have access? Yes, 66% agree. They want it, but their worry is that only the wealthy will have it. This is a techno-progressive base to be mobilized. This is, this are, these are people who want the promises that we offer, but want to make sure that it is universally accessible. So what I'm proposing is that techno-progressives have an opportunity to intervene in a variety of ways. 
We have an opportunity to intervene in social movements, to raise technology questions and framings that are currently uh, in, dis in debate or in dispute because of the pervasive Luddism that has seeped into some left quarters. We also have the opportunity and necessity of intervening in the transhumanist and futurist communities to raise the social question, to raise the question, okay, you're promising the end of work, and maybe someday we'll all get magic nano boxes that will bring us mana from heaven. Will there be any lag between those two when everyone might starve to death? Because if there is, we might need to have some redistribution of wealth and some basic income guarantee. <laughs> We need to intervene in public debates to frame these issues with the media, to try to create the crystallization that we would hope for. In conclusion, I just want to point to a couple of the areas where we can intervene with social movements. One is around reproductive rights and the framing of reproductive rights. Reproductive rights has mostly been about the uh, avoidance of pregnancy, understandably, the avoidance of pregnancy, the right to contraception and abortion, Less about the right to artificially uh, re reproductive technologies, the right to germinal choice, the right to choose the kind of children that you want to have. Um, similarly with the transgender movement, the LGBT movement, I mean here in France, I think, uh, I think it's still the case that uh, lesbians are barred by the state from having access to ARTs, right, okay, still this case here, and Italy also has a very regressive law in this regard. So I think around uh, LGBT community, we have a strong set of uh, <coughs> and demands that we can make for access to assistive technologies. Around cognitive liberty, the idea that we have a right to control our own brains, we have strong allies in the global struggle against the disastrous war on drugs. Now, I'm not a complete uh, abolitionist on the war on drugs. I think that there probably are drugs that should be regulated by the state. Uh, psychoactive drugs, and, and, and I think there'll probably be worse ones in the future. <clears throat> I don't want to see a future in which everyone has super methamphetamine in their head. But uh, the current drug law regime is obviously insane, and, the, and we saw this when British labor tried to reform their drug laws, and they came to the conclusion that alcohol was the most, most dangerous drug in Britain, and uh, ecstasy was the least dangerous drug in Britain, and the response of the labor government was to fire those guys. Um, similarly with ProVigil, the risk profile is extremely small and the benefits to society, as Anders has pointed out, extremely large. We can have a common cause with those folks, as well as with folks working for neurodiversity. I'm not a total uh, supporter of the autism rights movement. I think there's legitimate questions about whether kids should have uh, need the kinds of things that autism denies them, but there's an interesting debate to be had there. Around disability rights, we have difficult questions. You've heard some of them about the cochlear implant question. We have difficult questions about prenatal selection and whether what kinds of consequences it has for society to have widespread use of prenatal selection. I think our community has to support prenatal selection as a right. Um, but at the same time, we have to make sure that we don't, as a consequence of the diminution of the size of the number of people with disabilities in society, that we don't diminish our support for their capabilities and participation in society with assistive technologies, with, with whatever technologies they choose to enable themselves with. With the Greens, uh, I used to edit a, a journal called the Eco-Socialist Review, and, um, and so it's been a long, strange trip to where I am now. Um, but uh, part of it was realizing that I was not opposed to technologies, that the sustainable technology movement, the appropriate technology movement, uh, meant that I should take a look at, for instance, genetically, the role of genetically modified organisms as a potential solution to addressing uh, hunger in a world with radical climate fluctuations and uh, possibly using less water and pesticides in crops that I should look at uh, the potential use of nuclear power alongside renewable energy as one of the paths that might provide uh, a climate remediation. I think, you know, again, there are many important debates to be had, but we can't just immediately uh, adopt a, a Luddite attitude as a part of the solution. We have an agenda around the facilitation of human enhancement technologies. I think the most popular demand of transhumanists and techno-progressives is for life extension. It's very few people, many people say they don't want it, 
very few people turn it down. Um, when people get to be 80, very few people commit suicide. When they get to be 90 and they're taking a handful of drugs every day, very few people commit suicide. Um, so, yes, they may say they don't want it. I bet you they'll vote for it. Um, and it's a very popular demand that we need to put forward. Securing the longevity dividend. One of the, one of the most important connections between progressive politics and this particular demand is that the, long, the welfare state is very threatened in the coming two decades by the growing old age dependency ratio. And the reason it's threatened is because of the uh, need of those folks for nursing care, uh, the way that they pull the, their loved ones out of the labor market to take care of them. The healthier older people can be, we do have to renegotiate retirement age, we do have to renegotiate basic income guarantee and so forth. Those, those are inescapable. But the healthier older people can be, the more likely we can keep the welfare state from collapsing in the next 30 years. We need to ensure universal access to the benefits of enhancement. Now, in Europe, you're way ahead of the United States because you have universal health care systems, and we're just still struggling to force everybody to buy the crazy Amer private American health insurance. But um, for me, the most optimistic example of, of this particular struggle was around access to antiretroviral drugs. You know, 25 years ago, antiretroviral drugs, or 20 years ago, they cost $40,000 a year in the United States. So only wealthy gay men in New York City had access to them. No leftist ever said, oh, only gay white rich men have access to this drug. We should get rid of this drug. They say that all the time about human enhancement technologies, and they don't know why. What we did is with antiretroviral drugs is South Africa and Brazil and India said, if you don't allow us to start making these drugs in a cheaper way, we're just going to do it anyway, because we have a humanitarian right to keep people alive. That put pressure on the, on the companies. We created this fund, which has billions of dollars, and now 10, 20% of people with HIV in Sub-Saharan Africa have access to these drugs for a dollar a day. That will be the same struggle that we will face with every life-enhancing medication from bed nets to vaccinations, to cognitive enhancement drugs that has a true benefit for people that they want anywhere in the world. It's inescapable. We have to expand universal access. And finally, technological unemployment, which is, in my view and many, inescapable. <coughs> we are, I think, at the beginning of the period where technology will continually destroy more jobs than it creates. And in the end, there are very few Conceivable. Now, Eamon and I disagree on this, and Eamon will <laughs> have a chance to talk about that. Eamon, actually you did, earlier. You talked about the bottom-up uh, revenue schemes, the, the possibility of those. So, it, perhaps it's possible that it, my imagination is limited in the ways that we could generate income in the future. People talk about uh, digitizing or monetizing our labor, our, uh, our information exhaust, so that Google would pay us for every click that we make so that they could sell us more things or something. There may be ways around basic income guarantee. For me, basic income guarantee seems like the most obvious and immediate uh, demand that we can make to address the coming period of technological unemployment. And then, as Olivier was pointing to, we need to explore models of e-democracy. Last night, we met uh, at a local restaurant, the Technoprog folks, Amen, myself, David Wood, and we hammered out a declaration, which we put online, and um, are calling for folks from the futurist community to endorse. You can email any of us and let us know if you want to do that. Um, it's at IET.org, and we'll put it up other places as well. And we're hoping that this uh, intervention grows. Um, I, I'm not the bomb thrower or manifesto writer I was when I was a 22-year-old socialist activist, so I no longer expect to be leading you know, Boy Scout troops through the streets to take over the White House, but um, uh, at least having some tiny influence in the intellectual sphere will satisfy me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you to the most public discussion, so to kind of see next to Arnold Twyman. Um, so before uh, I ask uh, you people, the audience, uh, for questions, uh, maybe Mr. Twyman, if you have some reaction about uh, what James you just say, and uh, give a very uh, precise picture of the situation in the US. Maybe you, you can tell to us about the situation in the UK. Is it the same thing? Have you uh, seen the well, left-wingers, transhumanists <laughs> coming upwards? So, 
Yeah. Well, I'm trying to, um, off the top of my head, you know, I, I, I don't know if I've really thought about that before. I mean, the, the US situation is almost um, more extreme to the point of view of seeming almost cartoonish from a British perspective. Um, the, the left, the traditional political left, and I think this is similar to the kind of thing James is describing, the, the, the traditional left in Britain is ranges from being sort of um, technologically agnostic down to being sort of neo-Luddite. Um, and when, when you get people sort of embracing progressive, uh, social justice, leftist oriented ways of thinking and embrace technology, they have a tendency to not get involved with traditional political paths and start new things. But that, that leads to sort of a splintering. You've got all these, all sorts of new movements that that are effectively falling into these categories um, that need to be, they're going to be ineffective unless they can get a sense of being unified. And to be fair, they do try to reach out to each other, but this kind of getting a sense of communality is, um, is going to be important, I think. Um, yeah, it's, it's an odd one, the relationship between technology and the left. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. I will, so we are constrained by the time, as you know. So um, maybe I will ask the audience. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I want to note uh, of a possible European development that perhaps you're aware of that sometimes comes close to Transhumanist the idea, namely the European pirate parties. Uh, from my native Sweden, <coughs> it had some success being one a party in the European Parliament. The German pirate party has got at least one seat in the European Parliament, and this, it has seen some success in other countries like the Czech Republic. But what's your opinion of them? Is it something new, something fresh, or is it a fad? Well, I have to say first, I was very attracted to the Grüne uh, when they first emerged, and uh, I attended the first American Congress of the American Green Party um, as a kind of observer from the democratic socialist movement, hoping that there would, could be a politics beyond left and right. Um, and, and so I continue, that hope springs eternal, that there could be something new emerge. Um, the pirates, before the pirates, we flirted a lot with the radicals, the Italian Radical Party, which also had a faction within the European Union and in, at the United Nations. Um, and, the, and then those folks emerged eventually with the, Europe, the, the Italian socialists. I don't, you know, explaining Italian politics is beyond me, but, um, uh, but they, we did have some contacts in that direction. When the pirates emerged, personally, I thought it was uh, an impossible thing that you could have a successful party based on such a small issue as I saw it. But of course, they've been relatively successful. And people have argued from that example that transhumanists should organize their own party, like, like Zoltan argues. Um, I still don't think that the time is right for that. But I'm constrained by the fact that I come from a first-past-the-post political system, you know, where the two-party system is so hegemonic. Um, and in that, in that framework, it makes a lot more sense to have political action committees, think tanks, factions, caucuses, things like that. It may, if you're Israeli or you're Italian, it makes make, make sense to have a party. But we do have good t contacts with the pirates and actually anyone can say more about that. Yeah, um, I, my, like James, my first impression of the pirates was um, surprise at how, how well and how quickly it took off. And my, my take on that was that there was this large emerging spirit of people wanting a, a new way to relate these various social justice concerns with technology and the pirates just provided a, a way a something a bandwagon for people to get onto and so it kind of turned into this broad category it was, it was very exciting i think particularly in places like germany where it was really taking off um we the, when i was saying about groups who aren't sort of traditional leftists um the pirates in the uk are one of the two prime groups i think of um, the other one is uh, the zeitgeist movement who are very active, but they actively eschew sort of a, a political party, traditional politics, that kind of thing. Um, so there are a lot of... We're a political sense altogether. So yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're sort of more... Yeah, yeah. Um, now, so, but there's a lot in common, and a lot, of, a lot of people who would sort of naturally align for an event or a 
particular uh, activity or whatever. So there's a, 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 I think that's the kind of success that, that the Pirate Party drew upon. My, um, just one thing I will say is that um, I'm very much supportive of the whole techno-progressive uh, approach myself, um, but the, la the label I tend to use, is, as we've said, is, is social futurism. The only reason I've been using that recently is just because it rolls off the tongue slightly easier, and when you're speaking to someone who's not aware of these kind of issues, that sometimes can, can make the difference between their eyes glazing over within two minutes and three. Um, but I, I see these things as synonyms, so to basically different ways to approach one idea, uh, a sort of common purpose. And I think that's that's generally the way to view these things. So when you've got, so with back in the UK, I personally try to work with people from like-minded groups wherever possible. Try try not to get the labels get in the way. I, I mean, I'm, I think labels have an important role, and it's important to choose a label that has a context that people understand it in. So I'm Frankensteinian in that respect. On the other hand, they collect baggage. So for instance, the Zeitgeist movement is associated with technocracy. I hope we never get called technocrats. <laughs> it, has so, it has so much baggage at this point. Um, the, the advantage of techno-progressive, uh, from my perspective, is that um, of all the political terms associated with the left in the United States, progressive is the most popular. Twice as many Americans will say that they're progressive as will say that they're liberal, um, which is how bad liberalism has gotten a rap. So um, I just think in an American context, it works pretty well. Are rising, so maybe you, you can say a few words about um, the manifesto you wrote just yesterday at the restaurant. Sure. Well, it opens, uh, just to, to kind of give you the context of what it's uh, trying to do, uh, it opens by saying that the world is a very dangerous and unequal place, and that technology can make things a lot better or a lot worse, um, and that it's time for those of us who see the opportunities uh, for technology, emerging technologies, to intervene politically in ways that we haven't yet. Uh, then it tries to sketch out a little bit of this intellectual history related to the Enlightenment, uh, talk about our relationship to some of these other social movements as I sketched out here. Uh, the big and interesting discussion that we had last night was over um, this kind of core idea that I sketched out about human exceptionalism, uh, which many of us holds quite dear as an important topic, but which um, I have seen personally whenever we've held conferences on non-human personhood or uh, the possibility of, uh, of cyborgs and robots having rights and things like that. That is something that the media <laughs> zeroes in on and, and uses to, to whip us. Uh, so I think there's some interesting questions ahead about how moderate and radical and futuristic or we need to be in order to actually make a political intervention. That's that's a typical question on the left, I think, as well. Just um, another thing that comes up for me, it's, I've chatted with people about this here at this conference. When people hear about politics, there could, to my mind, there are two different things you could be thinking of. One could be um, traditional structures of political parties, what goes on in your governmental system and so on. And the other is the broader sense in which you're talking about the political and social dimensions of life, in which any decision you make, the way you choose to live your life is essentially a political statement. You're saying, these are my values, this is how I live, the freedoms I think I should have, other people should have, and so on. Um, there's a tendency, um, a pretty strong historical tendency in transhumanism and related movements to say politics is irrelevant. And I can completely understand that when we're talking about um, the perceived pointlessness of getting involved in traditional politics. I have, I have great respect for people who will attempt to dip a toe into that pool and, and try and get something done, because it's, it's hard. This is, it's hard work. But what I would say is that I think it's a mistake to go too far and say that Technology can be considered, and this is where the singularitarians are usually the most at fault. And now, sympathy's there too, but to imagine that technology can solve the world's problems without any reference to the social, ethical, or political dimensions. And this entire conference is addressing a question, that, the social question, that a lot of transhumanists would prefer to believe just doesn't exist. And I think what, what, what James, to my mind, what James is really saying here, that the core point is that there's a technological dimension to transhumanism and futurism, but there's also the question of how that relates to society, the impact on society, and the, and the implicit questions of the kind of society we want to have. 
And I think if we're going to be responsible advocates of transhumanism, we have to include the social question. Now, some people like Natasha have been saying this since the beginning, but there are, there are others who would prefer that this simply wasn't said. And I, I guess what the, when, I, when I read this statement last night, we all added our opinions. I was happy to support it from the outset because what it seems to be saying is that uh, te the technology is really coming along in leaps and bounds now. Developments are getting away from us. The world is still as divided as it ever was, uh, dangerously so in some ways. And it's time for us to take our ethical responsibilities seriously, step up and take a stand for the kind of world we would like to see these technologies lead to. So I mentioned another debate we had last night, which was that um, it was pointed out that the two places that we mentioned artificial intelligence in the statement, one was in relation to technological unemployment, and the other was in relation to the global catastrophic risks that we needed to be discussing. And so we uh, noted that we actually are somewhat more positive about the possibilities. You know, we see those risks, but we're also uh, positive about the possibility that artificial intelligence and robotics will uh, free human beings from, from toil. Yeah. Free human beings from toil. <laughs> yeah. And I think freeing human beings from toil is a, an old uh, and uh, very venerable and legitimate leftist goal. Unfortunately, not one that many contemporary leftists understand anymore. <laughs> Whenever you try to talk to a contemporary labor leader or a uh, democratic politician <laughs> and say, we'd like to free all people from work, they say, what? <laughs> Mark had a question. Will you speak in English or in French? En français. Okay. Bon, euh, je voulais quand même dire que euh, l'association Technoprog, évidemment, euh, se retrouve complètement euh, dans ce qui a été dit, c'est-à-dire que ce n'est pas quelque chose qui se passe seulement outre-Atlantique euh, ou euh, outre-Manche. Euh, donc, euh, voilà, il y a... Il y a une incarnation enfin, européenne en général, parce qu'on peut retrouver ça en Italie, en Espagne. Et euh, par contre, euh, euh, je, enfin, je, 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 je vois, je constate, nous constatons qu'en France, euh, eh bien, la, la seule organisation qui est maintenant plusieurs années... Euh, a émergé, s'est structuré, alors qu'on sait bien qu'il existe d'autres personnes euh, qui interprètent euh, le transhumanisme différemment en France, euh, qui sont plutôt par exemple côté euh, extropien, etc. Eh bien, euh, c'est le technoprogressisme euh, qui euh, est véritablement euh, structuré. Euh, alors, bon, on s'est demandé pourquoi, bon, enfin, on peut trouver une quantité de réponses. Euh, bon, on se dit c'est peut-être le, le filtre culturel euh, français notamment euh, qui fait que euh, ça émerge sous cette euh, forme-là. Euh, euh, donc euh, ça c'est une, une première chose. Donc évidemment que euh, l'association Technoprog est, est signataire de, de cette déclaration. Euh, je voulais euh, le dire aussi d'une autre manière parce que ça peut parler encore davantage euh, peut-être en, en France. Bien que ce que je veux dire maintenant, c'est quelque chose maintenant qui m'est plus euh, personnel, mais je me permets de le dire euh, quand même. Euh, euh, moi, je dis, un autre transhumanisme est possible. Voilà, c'est une manière de le dire et ça peut résonner euh, dans les oreilles de plein de gens. Euh, parce qu'on a vu tout à l'heure quantité d'exemples euh, de groupements, quand on est bien en France... Euh, qui, a priori, euh, on se dit qu'ils vont avoir une attitude forcément négative. Et d'ailleurs, euh, c'est souvent dans, de ces côtés-là qu'on rencontre les, les oppositions les plus vives. Et pourtant, euh, il me semble évident que sur le fond, si on comprend bien que le transhumanisme, ça peut être ça, ça peut être le technoprogressisme, eh bien alors on peut comprendre qu'un autre transhumanisme est possible et qu'on on, on peut euh, donc aller vers les solutions euh, qui sont euh, proposées politiquement. Euh, par exemple, par la, la voix de, de James ou de Amon euh, ce soir. Merci. Can I just say one more thing about the political framing of techno-progressivism? It's not simply in the context of this Western debate. I think it's also important as a statement of liberal transhumanism, and this is where we share many values with our libertarian comrades, uh, or friends, um, because I think that, that we will also see the emergence of techno-optimism allied with authoritarianism in other countries and in other frameworks. So for instance, Chinese uh, are very positive about genetic engineering, about cognitive enhancement, and so forth, but within a completely different non-enlightenment value framework. And so you may see the emergence of forms of techno 
you know, the use of these technologies, enhancement technologies in a political context in China, <coughs> other countries, that is authoritarian. I think it's very important for us to also embrace our liberal roots, you know, our, our claim that we should have cognitive liberty, reproductive freedom, and bodily autonomy. Yeah, uh, we'll give you my phone. Thank you. Something I don't understand, um, Alman, you, you mentioned politics as necessary to understand socialization of issues, people's lives, uh, not only work, but everything. We need politics to understand that. No, my, I, didn't, I didn't quite say that, but go on. Okay, yeah, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm just trying to put it together. Because this is very confusing to me. I don't think that there's what? this division that's trying to be proposed No, here. just in case it makes it clearer, I don't think politics is required to understand people's choices. I think people's choices are inherently political. There is a tremendous amount of truth to that. Now, I would remove political and put something else there, perhaps, myth-based, whatever it is. There's a couple of points I want to make here. I agree with almost everything that's said outside of that we're here and you're there. Not from you all, but from the techno-progressives here in France. It's, it's, I don't read French, and I'm sorry for that, but I didn't know this was on the website. I just found this out today, and I was horrified by it. The, uh, I'm progressive, and I work in the field of technology. I teach technology. I also teach social understanding of technology, and I teach ethics. So, with and all of that, there is a politicization Yes, indeed, it is part of everything. But when we talk about the, the downside of political parties, and James mentioned it, the, you know, why is there in the United States this two-party system? Well, why is there everywhere in this, well, in this world uh, a pitting against each other? It's, it, it's, I think that people think philosophically or ideology about their lives and socialization rather than strictly political. Okay, I, my, my personal take on this is that I, I personally would prefer to avoid divisions, or at least um, my general mode, when I'm dealing with any situation where there's someone with a different point of view, a different identity, background, whatever, I like to see that as just adding to the flavor of the mix. That's great. Yes. Different people have different conversations. But a thousand but, flowers bloom. But yes. we live in the real world. And in the real world, there are people with agendas and values, some of which are very, very different to mine. Yes, and I think that it was just mentioned by the moderator, or, and yourself, the Chinese, and what's going on in North Korea, and I, and I think, these people became politicizing and I think the technology. You're serious That's about, the real fear, yes, not other yeah, trends. Well, that, this is the point. If you're not, uh, not organized, yeah. if you're not prepared and have a clear sense of what your values are and are ready to stand up for them, in the face of another person, group, organization, culture, whatever, that has um, very different ideas, yes. and if they would, if, if that group, say the Christian right, someone wants to take away rights that I believe are important, then unless I have taken a strong stance and gotten organized about it, I will lose. But, it, but transhumanism has been organized for a long time. It's gone through its maturation, its development, but even in the 1980s, when Esfandiari wrote his book about the transhuman, no, he didn't come up with transhumanism, but he did develop transhuman. He was very political. He's with the United Nations. And he was someone who was um, very liberal, very much a socialist, coming from the Marxist realm. So uh, what I don't understand, and James, correct me if I'm wrong here, but just let me ask you, with IEET, and I'm a fellow, and I'm very honored to be a fellow, and I, I, I love it, as a matter of fact, are, we're all your political groups to start out with, was everyone a Buddhist? <laughs> no, no. Okay, then not. not all transhumanists were libertarian. You see what I'm saying? Sure. I wasn't, and I'm a pioneer, so it doesn't add up in my head. Abs absolutely. Uh, but I just think it's, we have to acknowledge that Extropy Institute and the, many of the publications of Extropy Institute embraced an eliminativist view of the state. That is, yeah, and... Private, uh, private law. You would hire your own judges. Privatization, so yes. yes everything. Like privatization of the internet so the government doesn't own it. But there, there was some <laughs> political diversity, like yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think, you know, the pro part of the problem with trying to be post ideological, and I, I think this is the hardest thing that we face, is that we're in a post ideological age. The millennial generation, the, the you know, kids between 18 and 30 right now, are the least ideological generation in American politics. They're the most uh, uh, independent of party politics that there's ever been. 
And so then to say well, we're going to launch, and it's, that's probably true in a lot of places in the world, and to say that we're trying this new flavor, and you just said it, I, movements mature. Feminism matured to the point where there were radical feminists, lesbian feminists, liberal feminists, bourgeois feminists. We're at the same point of maturation where we have to have yes, the same I kind of distinction. Yes, I agree 100%. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. Yes, professor. Thank you. <laughs>